Jim Emmons, Lady, Oklahoma, uh, farmer and rancher producer here uh, all my life. We're on the home place here. Our cover crop field that we're going to talk about today is known as the Axton Place. Uh, we've started working on it about six years ago uh, as when I rented that place. So, and currently right now we have a 15-way uh, mix that used to be called uh, uh, Jimmy Emmons Mix. And we've renamed that as Western uh, Mix as for our Western Soil Health Group. Uh, so we had a winter uh, rye crop for seed over there, but we had a really hard freeze uh, here and it was damaged. So we grazed that uh, crop out and then the first shower we got after graze out, we planted the cover crop. And actually it sat there and sat there quite a while. We got it up, but then we had no rain for about 30 days. And so it just sat there and sat there, but then it finally kicked in and we got a few showers and it's really taken off now and it's probably pocket high. So we gotta have the cover uh, to, to protect the soil. Uh, today with this infiltration test, I think it proves what we've been able to do here in the last eight years uh, without tillage and where we can take in, you know, six inches an hour easy, eight or 10 maybe. And uh, so the, keeping it covered, keeping it protected, but we also got to feed the biological activity. We found, you know, 30 earthworms to a square foot here today. Uh, they have to have a lot to eat. I mean, most people don't realize that that's the herd that we got to feed to. It's hard to keep uh, residue. I, I'll never forget the first year that we planned uh, cover in this field that we're sitting in. Uh, I was really worried what we we're gonna do with all the forage and the foliage that we had on top. Uh, and it, now I can't grow enough. I mean, we've got enough earthworms and biological activity that we're breaking down at a rapid speed. And I think that goes to prove what we've done with the soil here that we've been able to turn that around that quick because the activity has grown so much. Well, I, I tell everybody it's around 20 inches, give or take 20 inches. Uh, in 2011, we had seven. In 2009, or 2012, we had nine inches. Uh, the following 2014, we had 25 in the month of May. So we're, you know, we're seeing big extremes uh, in the weather in the last several years here. And uh, that's really what we want to hit home about is these weather extremes, how we lessen that effect in the amount of rainfall. If I can take in six, seven, eight inches of a 12 inch rainfall uh, within an hour, then I have no runoff and I have no loading of nutrients in the stream. But also, I'm banking that for future use. So when we roll into the dry spell, you know, that then we have the profile we have that to work with. You better have persistence and you better have patience to start with uh, because this is a slow process, especially the first three years. Uh, in the cover crops, as you're designing a mix, uh, it, there's nothing wrong with trying somebody else's mix. The problem is you're going to have to adapt it to your area. And, and this year, the, the species that have lived is species uh, put in there for drought. So our sunflowers, our forage sorghums, that millets especially, are very drought tolerant. They're the ones that made it. So you've got to, when you're mixing your mix up, you have to keep in mind the diversity is key and you've got to have diverse in that for moisture as well as, as growth and forage. Every, everything we plant, I like to have two or three purposes for it. You know, is it a good flowering plant to draw the bees and the, and the pollinators and, the, and the, the beneficials in? Is it going to do something for the soil? Is it like a buckwheat that's going to leak an acid in that helps free up uh, our phosphorus? Or is it a, a legume that's going to fix some nitrogen for us? Is it a good forage? Is it a good cover? Is it a, a leaf like a sunflower big enough to shade more of the ground with less plants? So everything has to have at least two or three benefits for, for me to plant it.
We had a conversation today with the, with the soil scientist here about uh, they think we, they need to reclassify this, this soil as how much it's changed in the last eight years. That's really intriguing and, and interesting that, to see that amount of change. So uh, I want them to pursue that and so we can get some hard data uh, what we've been able to do here. Also in this field where we're at, we've got corn growing with zero synthetic fertilizer in it. Uh, it's in the ground 30 days, a third of the way home. It's a 90 day uh, crop. Uh, and it has a really deep green color yet, so I know we're still got plenty of nitrogen for it. Uh, we want, that's our goal, is to get to zero inputs. Let the biology and let the soil do it. And uh, we're not after the 250 bushel uh, an acre yield here, we're after the profit. My name is Steve Walsbaum, I'm the State Soil Scientist for NRCS here in Oklahoma. And today we're standing in a, a producer's field in Dewey County, um, cropland field that uh, was harvested for, with wheat earlier this summer and then a cover crop was planted almost immediately after harvest to, to provide some cover, um, you know, produce the residue that we need to cover the soil. Um, and then also we can get a little bit of grazing use out of this. Uh, so it would have been planted mid-June we're here in mid-August, so it's had about 50 to 60 days of growth, um, and you can see how tall it is about, I would estimate we probably have about four to 5,000 pounds of uh, forage growth out here, so when we get to that point, uh, we can do a little livestock grazing, take a small percentage of this, put a few pounds on some cattle, uh, and then leave the rest for uh, residue to cover the surface. Um, this is part of our soil health management system out here. Uh, we do crop rotation, no-till. Um, the cover crop is another tool or another practice that ha provides some benefits. Um, it gives us plant diversity when we use multiple species. And in this mix today, we've got several different things growing. We've got some mung beans here, um, which are legumes, are going to provide some nitrogen. We've got a sun hemp here, which is another subtropical legume that is a really good nitrogen producer, um, puts a lot of nitrogen in the ground, provides some pretty stable uh, residue. The cattle don't readily graze that. Uh, then we've got some broad leaves here. Um, sunflower, a real aggressive root system, can work help break up a plow pan. Uh, we do graze this. The cattle actually like it quite well. Another plant that we use quite a bit is okra another really strong taproot that helps with infiltration, um, breaking up plow pans in the soil. And the cattle actually like those really well. Um, got a cow pea here um, that produces some nitrogen. And then we'll have several different types of grasses uh, growing. We've got a couple different types of, of millet that I, I call them mid or short millets. The millets are a good grazing grass. And then the taller grasses that you see behind me here, uh, primarily um, sorghum sedan grass. And then sometimes on our sandier soils, we'll put some Egyptian wheat in there because it, it's adapted well to growing in sandy soils. Um, the cattle don't really eat it very much. It's a pretty high lignin uh, content plant. And so it makes a really good cover uh, when this cover crop is terminated. And then we've got a couple of uh, a different cool seasons, uh, broadleafs. Um, this one's starting to wilt up pretty bad. Um, this is a forage collard, um, grows real well under a canopy in the summertime. Uh, it won't grow very well if you plant it as a monoculture in the summer, but as long as it's in the shade of another plant, it does well. And then we'll also have some tillage radishes uh, scattered throughout the, the uh, mix here. So, the goal is to, to hit a couple of our um, soil health uh, primary um, goals or responsibilities, um, principles that we follow. Um, one, provide that plant diversity. We want a lot of plant diversity because each different plant is making different kinds of organic compounds and sugars and pumping that into the soil. Uh, most of these plants as they're growing they try to attract the microbiology in the, in the subsurface around their roots uh, because those microbes can help provide that plant with food and water, the nutrients that it need, uh, needs and the water. 
Um, and they do that by leaking sugar uh, and other organic compounds into the soil to attract that biology. Um, so plant diversity, uh, the idea is we want to mimic what Mother Nature had here when this was a prairie, a lot of different species, different types of rooting systems, and a lot of different organic compounds um, going into the soil to feed that biology. So that plant diversity is one of our, our guiding principles. And then the other is we want to keep the soil covered. We need that insulating factor. Uh, it absorbs the impact of raindrops when we get heavy rainfall events, and it helps insulate the soil, moderate our soil temperatures, keep it cooler in the summertime so we get less evaporation, warmer in the wintertime uh, so that we get, you know, biological activity year round. Um, part of the, the, the system is the microbes in the soil take this organic matter and um, over the course of time, they will eat a percentage of that and cycle the nutrients that are stored in that organic matter and release those in plant available forms uh, so that the next set of plants growing can take those nutrients up and use them. So it helps to match that, um, that principle, keeping the soil covered. In my mind is the most important uh, part of, of soil health management in the Southern Plains is we have to keep our soil temperatures under control. Uh, we're here in August, uh, easily could have on a bare soil 130 or 140 degree temperatures. And at that, at that temperature, we, we really can't store soil moisture. Our evaporation rate is uh, pretty much 100% of what we get. Um, and then it also, those temperatures affect the biology because they start dying when your soil temperatures get up to about 113 degrees. They start anything above that, they start to die off. There's some grazing going on in this field at the moment. Uh, it's broken into different paddocks based on how much forage we have available. And the paddocks are designed uh, based on how much forage, how many uh, cattle we have, the size of the cattle, uh, the, the class uh, here. These are stalker cattle, so they're gonna eat approximately three and a half percent of their body weight per day uh, in forage. And so we wanna match their intake with what's available. We never want to take more than half. Um, a lot of times in these situations, we try to take about a third of what we've grown above ground uh, and leave the rest for residue and nutrient cycling and that type of thing. So that's the goal. Um, and we can figure those things out easily by clipping or doing an estimate of, of how much forage we have here and then depending on how often we want to move our livestock, we can de determine the size of paddock that we need. Um, typically, the producer here uh, likes to move every three or four days. So if he's got a group of, say, 30, 500 weight stalkers, he'll probably need somewhere between six and 10 acres every three or four days. Um, and he does that using uh, electric fence and a portable watering facility and he'll move them every three days. They adapt very easily to this system. Um, they'll learn about every th third day he's going to show up and he's going to put in a new fence for a new paddock and as soon as he gets that ready he opens the gate and most of the time they move themselves from one paddock to another because they're ready to get into some fresh uh, grazing, um, they're going to eat the best parts of these plants because they're only here for three or four days. Uh, they eat the higher quality, the higher protein part of the plant and leave the rest behind. Um, and it works really well for putting uh, weight on stalker cattle. We're here in August. Most of these cattle will gain at least two pounds a day in a system like this. And if we were on native rangeland in August, we'd probably be lucky to get a pound a day because we're getting late in the growing season and the, the plants are starting to senesce or, or set seed and the quality, forage quality goes down on rangeland. Really about after the 4th of July, it starts to go downhill. But this is still high quality forage. It's still actively growing. Uh, it hasn't got to the reproductive stage yet. So still a lot of protein content in here. Um, we were looking around a little bit earlier at some of these plants. We've been, we like to use a Brix meter to measure the the sugar content in some of these, um, anything above about an eight is considered good. Um, and the samples that we took earlier, most of them were at 10, 
or higher. So good forage quality. Um, so that's when we want to move the, the cattle is, is when those plants are at that high quality, which usually is in the afternoon, shortly afternoon. We've had some photosynthesis going on for a good part of the day. <clears throat> And so the, the sugar content's about as high as it's going to be in the early afternoon. And so when we move them into a fresh paddock in the afternoon, they get high quality forage. They're going to get, start eating immediately. And it helps put a little bit more weight on, uh, on our daily gain by, by doing that. Well, in this particular field, um, Jimmy, the producer, has been in the system for about eight or nine years. Um, you know, the soil health, he's, he does the crop rotation. He does cover crops. He's in the no-till. And that's all in, the, in an effort to rebuild the biological community that is under this soil. Um, when this was in a conventional tilled system, it was dominated by bacteria because they were really only fed once a year. Uh, it was pretty much continuous wheat production. So they were fed uh, whenever the wheat was harvested and it was plowed back underground. Uh, the bacteria dominate in that system because they get fed all of their food kind of once at once. Um, they can re reproduce very quickly and they kind of dominate the system. When you go to no-till and you stop that disturbance of tillage, you start building back the fungal community. Um, and the fungi are important because they're the ones that are really good at harvesting nutrients out of the soil and providing those to the plants. So the idea of, of soil health management is a combination of all these practices into a system uh, so that we build an underground ecosystem that's, that's uh, hospitable to other types of, of microbiology, in particular the fungi. Um, the diversity of plants that we have out here um, feeds a lot of different types and, and they all play a role in your bacteria are, are your primary decomposers. They do most of the decomposing, and then they are harvested by other elements of the microbi my, the biological community, um, protozoa, fungi, things like that will harvest the bacteria. And when they go through that process, um, the pr protozoa uh, especially, they release a lot of organic inorganic nitrogen that is um, plant available. It takes it out of that organic form, converts it to an organic form that they, that the, the uh, plants can take up. And it's all not, it's different forms of nitrogen. Um, conventional systems, we use a lot of nitrates. Uh, nitrate uptake in plants is very expensive for the plant because they, they take the nitrate up, but then they have to convert it to ammonium and then they're going to convert it to amino acids in the next step. And the plant uses about 15 to 20 percent of its plant energy uh, to do that. So it's pretty expensive. So we want, you know, a, a, a fair amount of ammonium uh, type of nitrogen in the soil that the plant can take up. And we also, if we would like to have amino acids in the soil so the plants can take that up because they don't have to go through that much of a conversion process. So. Um, a lot of different forms of nitrogen is important. It helps the plant become more healthy, uh, more resistant to disease, to insect pressure, uh, things of that nature. So, um, you know, we want a healthy biological community that's balanced according to the climate that we're in. Um, a plowed field dominated by bacteria. When we get into a system like this, our, our bacteria to fungi ratio will get closer to one to one and when we get to that point we're we're hitting the mark that's our goal is to have a balanced ratio between those two types of, of uh, microbiology.
I'm Greg Scott. I'm a soil scientist with Oklahoma Conservation Commission. I've been playing in soil for about 45 years. And this is the most fun we've ever had because we've discovered how fast a soil ecosystem can heal and come back to life when we apply the principles of what we call soil health. This is an experiment we've been doing to try to trace the water and how it gets in the soil. We know that we've got massive amounts of water going in the soil. Um, and you can see a little bit of red tint on that soil. We what dye a red dye, a real concentrated red dye. We dug a hole and filled it full of dye. We've put dye on the surface. We're trying to trace the macro pores and the macro movement of the soil or the water through this soil. So we dug that hole and we filled it with concentrated dye. And a foot of water went in in what, 30 minutes, less? And we thought that there might be some lateral movement because that was a lot of water in a short time. And so we dug down next to it to try to trace the lateral water movement of water through that soil. And virtually a little bit of water came to that surface, but virtually all this water is just going straight down in the soil. There's very little lateral movement. And that's good for the soil. It shows me that we've developed an incredible network of pores. In fact, one of the things that's making this work so good is that all of the fresh organic matter that's coming out of these plants, that the plants exude in the form of sugars and starches, uh, fats, amino acids, proteins even, are uh, fats that react with the calcium to create basically soapy <laughs> organic matter in the soil that breaks surface tension and helps pull that water down into the soil. So all of this fresh organic matter is functioning in several ways to give us what we're getting today. But again, we thought we would see a lot of dye coming laterally in the soil, but it essentially just goes straight down. And I don't think we'll turn the Canadian River red, but uh, this dye is, is bonding to the soil, red dye and red soil. It's hard to see it, but most of that movement is down the faces of these cracks in this structure that the soil has built. And again, this is a function that happens over time with the plants and animals that live in the soil. So our, our attempt to trace what we know are more difficult than we thought. But uh, this soil has just had such a dramatic change over the years that we're getting more water movement uh, through the smaller pores than we ever expected. Now that's good for the farmer. We have put on six inches of water in less than four hours with no runoff. Uh, most people would look at that and say, that's impossible, that can't be done. Not even healthy soils, they expect to take that much water. So just briefly, when we talk about Jimmy's program, he converted from tillage to no-till. When he did that, he quit building the boundaries that existed in that soil from tillage. All tillage tools compact and make horizontal boundaries and destroy the macro pores in the soil that would move large amounts of water. And that was his first step. But if he had only done that practice, he'd have got a little improvement, but he would have never got to where he is today. Uh, the second thing he did was get into a crop rotation. Plant diversity, depending on who you ask, is the most important of those five principles of soil health. Not everybody agrees, but it's one of the tools that we have to help this soil recover health. Because just like you or I need to eat a balanced diet, just like our animals need a balanced diet, the soil needs a balanced diet of organic matter and that comes from a diversity of plants. We dug about 30 inches before we started seeing soil that was light in color. So we were seeing dramatic inputs of carbon into this soil. And that is like, um, in, in one way you could call it a money market account. We're always building organic matter, but we're always using it to feed the current crop. 
So it's a stable store of nutrients that, uh, but you have to have the microorganisms to bring it out of storage, process it, release the nutrients, even as the plants are pumping more carbon back in the soil.